Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful event. And this is an amazing place to, to, to host it. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I also like to thank the organizers that they carefully arranged that, that Pierre Will gave a, a nice mini course on exactly this topic. Uh, so I'm assuming that everybody here either went to that course or else are ex sort of more senior people who probably heard somebody like me or some of one of my friends talk about complex hyperbolic space um, many times before. So I'm going to cut straight in um, at the interesting stuff and miss out the usual 30 minute introduction all about things. Before I start, I want to do some shameless advertising. Uh, Brian Bowditch, Sir Piao Tan, and I are organizing a conference in Warwick in July next year. The title is essentially a permutation of the words in the title of this meeting. So therefore, I'm assuming that everybody would be interested, who's here, would be interested to go. Registration is now open. Um, and so um, you are more than welcome to register and, and come along. I hope to see you there in Warwick. Well, I can guarantee that the weather will not be quite as warm as it is here, even though there it will be summer and here it's winter. Okay, so, so let's come, come to the subject of the talk. So we're going to, I'm going to assume that you have remembered from Pierre's talk, so recall... What the definition of, of complex hyperbolic space which in the language which Ursula was using is the symmetric space associated to, to, the, to the Lie group SU21 or if you're a hyperbolic person then this is the natural generalization to higher complex dimensions of the Poincaré disk. So really you should think of the Poincaré disk as being re a complex hyperbolic one space as well as being real hyperbolic two space. And this is where we're going to live. So the holomorphic isometry group is going to be uh, PU21 or PSU21 one and so just like you're familiar with from classical hyperbolic geometry i will blur the distinction between sl and pl and here i'll blur the distinction between su and pu um, so this is holomorphic isometries and i they are classified just as you're used to into elliptic, parabolic, and loxodromic, and the classification is by trace. And I hope Pierre covered that. Into elliptic. So here is my cartoon picture of complex hyperbolic space. And I'm going to be thinking about groups generated by reflections, each of which fixes a complex line. So we want to have, we're going to have complex lines L1, L2, L3, with, and reflections. R1, R2, R3, and so Ri, Li, point-wise. And, and so let's draw uh, these complex lines. Find my colored chalk, Some nice green lines. So because I can't draw four-dimensional pictures, let's just draw line something like this. And then we could maybe think of the reflections. OK. 
Okay. Now, the, the first difference here to anything that you're used to is that reflections do not necessarily need to have order two because the, the uh, co-dimension, sorry, the, 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 the orthogonal space of a, co of a complex co-dimension one space is a complex line, and so, so there's some angle that you can have in there. For the majority of the talk, I will be thinking about complex reflections of angle uh, pi, so of order two, but we, um, so let's just say that they, these, these reflections have angle, um, well, I'm going to say 2 pi over p, and for most of the talk, so p is in, well, p is in n, p is bigger than or equal to 2. Uh, p is the letter that we use for historical reasons, because Mosto used P. P is not a prime, although in this case P equals 2, of course, is a prime, but we will not necessarily be restricting to primes, but that's just, the, although number theory does come into things a little later on. So what is the, the space of three complex lines, or rather, what is the dimension of that space? Uh, well, you're used to the fact that if I have three lines in, well, Euclidean space, or perhaps not Euclidean space because there's slight, some slight um, there's dilations, but certainly in the hyperbolic space, I can parameterize the set of three lines by the angles or distances between them. And so, therefore, you would, the, 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 there's a three-dimensional space of lines up to the action of isometries. So, so the dimension of the space of triples of complex lines up to, up to isometry Well, it's now four. So it's no longer three, which is what you would expect. And this is what gives a, this extra dimension is what's going to make life interesting for me a little bit later on. So we can think of three, three angle parameters if the intersection lies inside the complex hyperbolic space or distance in the ultra parallel case, plus an extra one which is usually called the shape invariant. And roughly speaking, this measures how the complex lines are lined up with respect to the complex structure. So I'm going to be interested in the group gamma generated by R1, R2, and R3. And I'm going to be interested because, well, this is the sort of thing that, that really the only thing that ever interests me. I'm going to be interested in when is that group discrete. And in fact, I hope that for most people in this room, that is the only question that ever. You know, if you give, give somebody stops you in the street and gives you a group, Usually, your first reaction is, is it discrete or not? I mean, for some people, there's, there's, you know, in other conferences, they want to know whether it's finite or infinite or something. But, you know, we always like things to be discrete. So right, the main question is, and somehow I've already jumped the gun by assuming that my Reflections have got angle 2 pi over p, because if they were reflections or an irrational angle, I'd fail discreteness from, from the beginning. And therefore, I may as well choose the minimum angle here, um, and that's kind of a, a running assumption. So there are two ways you can approach things like this if you want to, to actually work out what the, uh, how, how examples run, is you can either um, fix your, your favorite 
uh, structure, complex hyperbolic structure on the ball, uh, and then, um, then do all sorts of, of complicated uh, gymnastics with, 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 uh, with all of your coordinates, or you can fix the coordinates of your lines and then do all sorts of complicated gym gymnastics with the structure on your space. And so this, what I'm going to do is the latter. So I'm going to assume, so each of these lines has a polar vector, a normal vector, which is, um, which maybe it can be in orange. So, I mean, this is somehow, this is not really how it works, but this is my cartoon version of how it works. In fact, what, you re what I really should be doing is I should take this line, I should sort of come out into the, the space out here, and I'd have a positive vector. I guess this one would be N3 and so on. But morally speaking, that just for, for your visual things, there's a normal vector, and that's going to be completely determine what happens with that line. So I'm going to assume that the normal vectors... are the, the three coordinate vectors and then I'm going to just work accordingly um, and, and that's going to give me uh, um, uh, the emission form that I need to, to build my complex hyperbolic structure and that just makes life easy for me. And so if I have some internal or some angles associated with the triangle. I should say, most of what I'm talking about today, these things are going to intersect inside, and so I can talk about angles between the lines. Um, I guess, is it tomorrow or Thursday that, that Anna Pratusevich is going to be speaking? She's going to be thinking about the ultra parallel case. And somehow that's why we switched the order of these talks so that she could, she could do what I did to Pierre. She could assume that everything that, uh, that I'm, I'm saying. Right. And I'm, I'm going very slowly, never mind. So if I do this, I'm going to, and I'm going to write it over here because I just want this to be somewhere where I, which I don't erase over here. I can, I can then build my Hermitian form based on something to do with angles um, of the triangle. So my Hermitian form is going to be H, which I'm going, I'm going to stick in the, um, that the order two reflections at the moment, so I'm going to leave plenty of space so that I can come and change this later. And then I'm going to have numbers rho, sigma, and tor, because this is Hermitian, it ought to be symmetric like this. And these are going to be, this is going to be my Hermitian form. Which you can think of as being rather like the gram matrix, which you would do if you were doing um, uh, Coxeter groups. And, and so th this records the angles of the triangle. Um, and so I'm going to have mod rho is going to be 2 cos pi over r. Mod sigma is 2 cos pi over s. And mod tor is going to be 2 cos pi over t. And then this, these should be the angles. So the angle between 1 and 2 should here be pi over r. The angle between, uh, two, uh, that's supposed to be a 2, between 2 and 3 should be pi over s. And this one should be pi over t. Somehow that one seems to have missed. Never mind. And of course, this can be, it could be 0. And I'm going to normalize it so that 2 is less than or equal to R, is less than or equal to S, is less than or equal to T, is less than or equal to infinity. And infinity just means that the lines are ultra, uh, they're parallel, they're asymptotic, and so the reflection, uh, the, the product of the reflections is going to be uh, a parabolic map. Okay. And so this also means that mod rho is less. Um, this is less than or equal to zero and less than or equal to two. Good. For most of the time, I'm actually going to, to uh, ignore, oh, well, 
that was supposed to be colored chalk, but it didn't have any colors in it. Um, I was looking for some red chalk, but it's over here, or well, some orange that'll do. Most of the time, I'm going to ignore the case where one of these angles is a two, and I'm going to put a three, and that means I ignore that and put a one here. Simply because when, when I have uh, one of these numbers being, being zero, then, um, th then, then things become much more rigid and, uh, and there's a very different story. And so then these become my, my three, of, three of my parameters, my angle parameters, if you like, and my shape, shape invariant. It, well, you can either say it's the argument of rho sigma tor, or you could, you could think of it as the real part of rho sigma tor. Either of those will be fine, because of course they're equivalent, because mod rho sigma tor is already given by the other parameters. Notice from this that I'm free to choose the argument of two of my parameters, and sometimes there will be different conventions and different times when I'm, I'm, that's, that's convenient for me. And that's a little bit of liberty that I've left myself. So I said back here that I was interested in uh, classic. I know that there's some. I can classify elements by their trace, and that's going to be very important as I'm moving through this parameter space. I want to know how to express traces of different group elements in terms of my parameters, and there are some very beautiful formulae. Beautiful combinatorial formulae for traces of elements of gamma as polynomials in mod rho, mod sigma, mod tor, and, um, and rho sigma tor. And these are due, initially, the, the first examples were due to, to Hannah Sandler, and then later extended by, to, by Anna Pratasevich. Okay. So that's my general setup. Let me talk about uh, a sort of a motivating example. And this is the case where R equals S equals t equals infinity. And so in this case, mod rho equals mod sigma equals mod tor equals two. It's equivalent statements. So here we just have one parameter, which is essentially this shape parameter, which you can think of as being the argument or the real part of rho sigma tor. And so let's just make it, it doesn't really matter what, which, which one we make it. So, so, so the picture is that we have this parameter, this is the shape invariant. And we have the representation of this where, where rho, sigma, and tor are all real. Um, and so that's, that's uh, well, they're, they're all, uh, I want to be careful here, and I want to have, um, let me get this right, I want to have rho sigma tor to be, to be minus one, so, so here 
we, we've got minus eight, so this is, maybe we can think of as this as being the real part of rho sigma tau, and up here it should go between eight because its absolute value is going to be rho sigma tau, which is eight. Over here, the group lies in SO21 sitting inside SU21, and it's just the usual group generated by reflections in an ideal triangle in the hyperbolic plane, thought of as being a totally real plane uh, sitting inside there. So maybe you could think of all the coordinates being in real numbers. And so that's, that's perfectly good discrete and faithful and everything and nice and everything you want it to be representation over here uh, all of the the reflections have collapsed down the, the, all of the complex lines are the same all the complex reflections have, have collapsed down and here we get a group of order two so you have to there's something is going to go on in between and we need to, to know what's going to go on in between. So we start out here, everything should nicely be continuous, and we're nicely varying things. What's going to happen? Well, here is the answer, and this is, this is a, well, it's, it started out by paper of Goldman and me, which we almost solved the problem. We left a conjecture, which was solved by Rich Schwartz. But there's a number here, which I, I guess I perhaps should have put a little further in this direction because it's really quite, uh, and this is, this is 61 over 8, which if you check is slightly less than 8, but not very much. And everybody in here is discrete and faithful. Choose a different color. Everybody in this interval here is non-discrete, and we get something happening very interesting at this this end. And this is this at this point is in the. I'll talk more about that in a moment if I've got some time. So that's a sort of our prototype picture that we should should be able to deform all of the way along until something something interesting happens at the end and then things go wrong after that and what is the the crucial thing that's happening here the crucial thing is that in this green zone the open green zone the word r1 r2 r3 is loxodromic here r1 R2, R3 is parabolic, and here R1, R2, R3 is elliptic of infinite order. Okay, so suddenly we've discovered that this, work, this particular group element, R1, R2, R3, controls discreteness of, the, of this group in some sense. You could think, 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 if you like, if you want to be uh, competitive, you could think over here, there are all of these group elements, most of whom are loxodromic, and they, they're all traveling along, and by the time they get to this end, they've all become either the identity or, or a reflection. Right? And so somehow there's a competition between who becomes parabolic first, because they're going to continuously deform from being parabolic, elliptic through parabolic and into loxodromic. Right? So, so the person who wins in this race is, is R1, R2, R3. Very good. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, you can see it uh, if you're if you're what, kind of looking at how a fundamental domain is going to deform. Then then somehow everything is going. I mean, 
going to be fine until somebody crashes into themselves and, and it's really the first person to crash into themselves in a, like in a pinching type, type thing. Yeah, that's um, some sort of answer. I mean, I have lots of geometrical intuition about many of these things, but that's, it's, it's basically you, you're deforming fundamental domains and, and watching for them to collapse. Um, why it's that particular group element, I don't know. But, um, and we'll just see in a moment that for different triangle groups, it doesn't have to always be. Oh, that's a, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so then this, this um, led um, uh, well, Rich Schwartz to, to, to develop a conjectural picture. So this is a conjectural picture which he, he wrote up in his ICM uh, proceedings paper. Okay, so we're going to let WA be the word R1, R2, R3, R2, and WB be the word R1, R2, R3. Now we're in the general setting, not just this, this particular example, right? So but we're still order two. So, so here, reflections, order two. R less than or equal to S less than or equal to T less than or equal to infinity. He's got, he says that gamma is type A if WA becomes elliptic for WB, so if WA wins the race, um, then we're type A, and you can guess what type B is. Right. And so these are the two group elements that are going to control discreteness in, in his picture. Okay, so first of all, to give you a feeling for where, how, um, how, how these behave, so we've got a theorem which was conjectured or essentially written, written as a theorem by, by Rich, but based on computer experiments and was then proved by Grossi, which says that, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start by writing gamma RST, I, because otherwise life is going to be too short to write, um, is type A. If R lies between three and nine, it's type B. So there's some gap in the middle with like 10, 11, 12, and 13. And sort of for those, you have to be slightly more careful because it's going to depend on S. So this is just saying the very the smallest of these three numbers controls the type, apart from in this sort of middle zone here. And then... Um, um, what? As we travel along this, this parameter space, they're both going to start off being loxodromic, and as we, as we move along this parameter space measured by the shape invariant, so maybe I, yeah, there's a, there's a sort of a... So what? we fix RST. For each RST, there's going to be a picture like this. 
And, and as I'm, so, so there's, remember there's four parameters, RST fix three of them. I've got a one dimensional space here. And as I travel, and I, and I know that at the, at the, uh, the, what the, the, the Fuchsian case, where it preserves a totally real play, plane, then these things are going to be loxodromic. Um, something bad is going to happen at the other end. Um, it's slightly more subtle when, when we're not in this case. But, but then, as we travel along here, then um, somebody is going to lose, win this race, and some of it, somebody's going to lose this race to become elliptic first. And I'll, I'll make the, the conjecture slightly more precise in a second. Okay? And, and in the middle here, between 10, 10 and 13, the, the, you have to, it all depends on S and T as well. Okay, so that's, that's easy. Yeah. This is what the theorem is about, to, the, con the conjecture is about to say. Okay. Um, just a moment, I've missed, okay, yeah. So then this is the conjecture. If gamma is of type A and WA is loxodromic, then gamma is discrete. If gamma is type B, WB is loxodromic, and gamma is discrete. Okay, so that's this is the conjectural picture. The conjectural picture is that these two elements control discreteness, exactly as Mahan just, just said. Um, Well, he, he did quite a lot of computer experiments, no, because he's Rich Schwartz, right? Um, and, um, yeah, it, it's, it sort of it feels believable. I'm about to tell you the cases where it's been proved. He also said, um, he also said that if, let me write this up here, that if, if it were if type WB and... W B uh, uh, sorry of type B and W B is elliptic then non-discrete. And that's actually false. So the, so the there are cases where where we're of type B um, WB is elliptic, um, so, well, I'll put some numbers here, and then later on you'll discover what these numbers mean, but I'm going to write 18, 18, 18, 18. And you'll see, I'll tell you what that means in a moment, but if I don't write it now, I shall forget to, to tell you. Okay, so then this is, so it's, it's true, conjecture is true, in the various cases. Case one is when R is sufficiently large, no bound given, right, which is which is a theorem of riches. So, uh, so again, it's not very helpful, but um, at least it tells you that far enough into the, up into the sky. Um, of course, case two, we've just seen infinity, infinity, infinity. This was, this was the, um, exactly the content of this conjecture that, that Bill and I made and, and that, um, and that uh, Rich, Rich proved.
Pierre and I proved it in the case 3, 3, infinity. And in the case 3, 3, n, I proved this with uh, Jian Wang and Bo Hua Shi. And there is, in the latter case, there is definitely a geometric um, feeling for this because we, you can really see Dirichlet domains collapsing. So that, is, that, is that a reasonable evidence that it might be true? So there's roughly three types of behavior that are going on. Um, If both WA and WB are loxodromic, and so conjecturally every word that was loxodromic in the original triangle group is still loxodromic, so we're in a faithful representation, then we should be discrete and faithful. and we have a, di a disk bundle over the appropriate uh, triangle or befold. Type 2, WA or WB is elliptic, and the other is loxodromic. In fact, I, I will concentrate on the case where WA is elliptic and WB is loxodromic. And then sort of some sort of intermediate behavior happens. And so something interesting happens. We'll talk about that in a second. Type 3, WA and WB are elliptic. And maybe let's just assume, because we want things to be discrete, then there should be finite order. Well, if gamma is discrete in this case, sort of the folklore wisdom says that it's a lattice. Okay, and I'll give you the examples of those in a second. So there's sort of three very different sorts of behavior. Let's concentrate for a moment on this sort of interesting case in the middle. So let's just think about two at the moment. And, and let's say then that, that WA has finite order. And I can associate uh, a, a parameter here, which let me, I need to get this the right way around. Um, dub, 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 dub. Um, dub, 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 Is it gone? One, two, three. Yeah. We, 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 there's something which is rho sigma minus tor bar, and if we take it, absolute value. This, is, this plays exactly the same role as rho did for 1 and 2, and sigma did for 2 and 3, and tor did for 3 and 1. And I'm going to let, let this be 2 cos pi over u. And if I have this, this setup, then I'm going to write this as rst semicolon u. And those four numbers completely determine the group, because this you can unpack and you discover the real part of rho sigma tor sort of sitting in the middle of there. 
And that's exactly what this 18, 18, 18, 18 case meant. That in that case, uh, we have, um, it, it, well, it's, um, it's one of these, these guys. Right. So there's some interest, in, in this case, there are some interesting non-discreteness results which I'll say before I forget, and I've got a little bit of space here to say that. Um, so there's a little bit of an industry going on for finding non-discreteness results. In this case, uh, Shigiasu Kamiya has, has many papers, and Anna also has, has some papers on that. But I'm, I'm, sort of an, I'm not a pessimistic type of person. I want to focus on the positive things. I want to focus on discreteness rather than non-discreteness. So the, the, uh, these groups, I want to sell these groups to you as, as being quite interesting to study. And why should you think that they might be interesting to study? Well, okay, so I'm dealing with this reflection triangle group. Let's just for the moment, just for a very brief moment, pass to the, the index two uh, rotation subgroup of that triangle group. I'm sure we're all happy with doing that. And if my triangle group happens to be equilateral, let's also throw in the equilateral symmetry. And I'm, so I'm going, to be, I'm going to say some things that are true up to commensurability, and it's exactly those, three those two things, which are uh, passing to the rotation subgroup and allowing threefold symmetries where appropriate. So then this, um, this group, which I've just erased in the infinity, infinity, infinity case, where... WB was parabolic. This is a result of Schwartz that we um, we just passed to a to maybe call it gamma prime, which is commensurable to gamma. It's this thing where I have to pass the index two subgroup and then add in the threefold rotation. Then H2C quotiented by gamma prime is a complex hyperbolic orbifold but the interesting thing is whose boundary is the white head link complement This is suddenly interesting because real hyperbolic manifolds suddenly pop up in a slightly unexpected place. So similarly, yeah, the, the, there's a domain of discontinuity. <coughs> excuse me. There's a domain of discontinuity, and you quotient that domain of discontinuity by the group. It's a, it's a topological statement, and that topological manifold just happens to be hyper, have a hyperbolic structure. Uh, but there's, nothing, there's no hyperbolic structure uh, around that. It's just, it's just that it's, it's interesting, because normally when you, ex, when you see boundary um, manifolds, you don't expect hyperbolic things to show up there. Well, I mean, perhaps you do. Perhaps we should, but somehow we're not conditioned to. So similarly for RSTU, we should get... When we pass by passing to the rotation subgroup and whatever, uh, we should get similar behavior, similar hyperbolic, co complex hyperbolic
orbifolds with interesting manifolds as boundary. And so the big question, which boundary manifolds show up? And how are they related? R S T U. Um, I have some some uh, combinatorial ideas of how to construct uh, this these manifolds combinatorially, and then I believe that if I were to know Snappy uh, sufficiently well, I could feed that data in and get lots of results. Of course, I don't yet know that these groups are discrete, and so this may be just fantasy. But that's an interesting project which I sort of have on the back burner. But um, it should be possible to do some interesting things there. So, what are the cases that are known? Um, so four, 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 seven. This is due to Schwartz. So this is a particular hyperbolic, closed hyperbolic manifold obtained as um, a branch double cover of, of, of uh, S3, where the branching occurs on a particular three-string braid. So it's a very, very concrete construction. I don't know what the, what the kind of the, um, the intrinsic name of that manifold, or even if anybody has ever, ever given it a name in the, in the sort of hyperbolic three-dimensional world. So it's a particular closed hyperbolic manifold, which I'm not even going to begin to try to describe. But, but it's interesting because there we had what. A, cusped manifold, and here we get a closed manifold. Um, and if we have 3, 3, infinity, infinity, you see this is the same three things that showed up over there. This is due to, to, to me and Pierre. We get the whitehead link complement again. Yeah, yeah, infinity is going to produce as parabolics. Uh, 3, 3, n, infinity, uh, 3, 3, sorry, let's say 3, 3, 4, infinity. We're going to get the figure 8, now complement. That's due to Falbal and Duro. Uh, 3, 3, 5, infinity. It's another particular not complement, another hyperbolic not complement. I meant to look up what its name is. Well, I know that we know what its name is, um, and I can't remember exactly which name it is. It's one of the, I mean, the ones where you can, uh, the complement you can glue by small numbers of tetrahedra. And then there's. I think this is going to be have some question marks here. The three three uh, n infinity um, should be appropriate Dane fillings of the Whitehead link complement. And I this is work that certainly, when well, last I spoke, was in progress, but may well have been finished by, by Miguel Acosta, who's a student of, of Elisha Falbell. Right, so, so we have, on the boundary, we have something that locally looks like the Heisenberg group. And, you know, you build, well, the way I like to think about it, I, I build some sort of fundamental polyhedron for this object, um, which in the whitehead link complement sort of looks like an octahedron, and it has somehow some side identifications, and it has parabolics in the places you would expect it to have. Sorry.
Right. The, 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 the z plus z ends up being, the, the, the end up both being powers of the same element. So the, I mean, these groups are they're not they're not anywhere near faithful representations of these fundamental groups. So, I mean, this is a sort of a geometrical statement, right? Okay, uh, finished there. Time. Okay. Good. Okay, so now we're at the point where that's as pretty well everything that's known at least by me in the case of order two generators so now let's switch to to higher order generators so now let's to have r1 r2 r3 complex reflections as before but now with angle uh, 2 pi over p, where p uh, is bigger than, well, we can still think about p being uh, less than infinity. Occasionally I'm going to talk about 2. Ah, one thing I forgot to tell you, we were interested in lattices, weren't we? So the, the four examples of lattices would be Five, 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 five. That's essentially due to Livne. Four, 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 five. That's due to Thompson. Uh, no, so that's due to to Darrow. Then there's three, three, four, seven, and three, three, five, five, which are due to my student James Thompson. And they're all arithmetic, and those are the only four lattices that we get in that case. But this is like a, a prequel because we're going to be interested in lattices, and very soon I'm going to be interested in arithmeticity, and I'm going to maybe explain in slightly more detail the cryptic comments that Ursula made about arithmeticity. At least she was in higher rank where, this is, where, where, where everything is arithmetic, but now we're still in rank one. And maybe if you're, if you're not familiar with these things, I'll give you, at least I hope to give you a proper definition of arithmeticity. Right. So now I'm, I have to um, change my Hermitian form. I'm just, just for convenience, I'm going to let u be e to the 2 pi i over 3p, because, um, and I'm going to, th this form changes. Um, no longer are these, these things going to measure something to do with angles. They're going to be, I'll explain what it is in a moment, but let me just write it here. You see, you have to just do some subtle changes here. I know it so well, I've done it, I can do it in my sleep. Um, so now let's just think a little bit before we go, we go much further about what's going on when I have a pair of lines. So I, my lines previously were green. And if I can find some green chalk, they can stay being green. So here I've got a pair of complex lines, maybe let's say L1 and L2. And now I've got reflections of order P around them. Order P. So, so it's no longer quite like the picture we're used to with ordinary reflections where you have reflect, reflect, and you get a rotation, or if they're ultra-parallel, a translation. In the case where they intersect, we could think of putting a little sphere here, and on that sphere, my, my lines are going to be points because this is supposed to be like a, a, like a dual sphere, so I'm, as I'm doing a projectivization, and I'm going to have sort of... I'll maybe put those points further apart. And then I'm going to have some, some angle here of maybe pi over p. 
pi over p here, and then something interesting is going to happen up there. Right? And, so, and of course, if they were ultra-parallel, then I would have a, a, an orthogonal complex line, and, and that would be a hyperbolic plane, and I would be doing the same picture in that, in that line. But we still have the thing that used to be the angle here, pi over r, uh, is still showing up in, in some sense. Um, and, and that's kind of one of the interesting things. Um, so so what, ha what do you know about what happens in triangle groups uh, that, are, that look like this? Well, you no longer have the product of these reflections of being the right order, because that would be somehow like saying that, the, that this thing had to be the product of these things. But you do know something. So let's just write out what it would mean to for this uh, group element to have order R. So R1, R2, R1, R1, R2, R1, R2, all the way through R times. And in the, in the involution case, that was the identity. And so what happened, what do we need to do when we, when we make these things have higher order? Well, what I need to do is put inverses on the last R of them. In other words, uh, instead of having these products of involutions having order R, they satisfy a generalized braid relation of length R. So now, if let's just say mod rho is, is 2 cos pi over r, then r1, r2 satisfy the braid relation of length r. In other words, r1, r2 to the power r over 2 is r2 r1 to the power r over 2, where r over 2 should mean that you just do r, um, r of these letters, um, and if it's even, then that really is r1 r2 to, a, to some power, and if it's not, then you, you put the, um, the last one becomes the, 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 the same as the first one. So for example, uh, when r equals 3, we just get the classical braid relation R1, R2, R1 is R2, R1, R2. A braid relation of length 2 would mean that they commute, uh, and higher order braid relations coming in. Right? And so now, when I, when I speak of, of RST, R, or even RSTU, I'm no longer saying these group elements have that order, I'm saying they satisfy a braid relation of that particular length. And, and then, it, so if I'm in this situation that I was here where R1, R2 have got angle 2 pi over P and, and we, they braid with length R, then this R1, R2 is a central extension. triangle group of, in the, in the case when R is even, we get this right, when R is, okay, when R is even, it's a central extension of the rotation subgroup of an R over 2 PP triangle group. The center is generated by R1. R over 2, and when R is odd, it's a central extension of a 2RP triangle group, and the center 
is R1, R2 to the R. And so, and because you then know um, when these triangle groups are going to be spherical, Euclidean or hyperbolic, that's the same as when these two lines are going to be uh, intersecting parallel or ultra parallel. So this is going to give us some notion of what all these numbers that I'm going to start to throw around in a moment are. Right, I've got eight minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, I want to tell you that the, the interesting thing is that we're going to get lattices this way. And the, in, the, the second most interesting thing is that non-arithmetic lattices are going to show up this way. And the third most interesting thing is that every known non-arithmetic lattice in SU21 shows up in this way. So let me... Uh, give you a very brief explanation of what arithmeticity is. Well, this is going to be a slight digression. So this is a little digression on arithmeticity. So let script G be a linear algebraic group to find the Q. Now, those are words that used to strike fear into my heart. And if they strike fear into your heart, let me reassure you and tell you what this really means. What it really means is it's a subgroup of, of GLMC for some M. Okay, let me say this because people are writing it down. Subgroup of, of GLMC some M, where the N matrix entries satisfy a system of polynomial relations where the polynomials are defined over the rationals. And okay, if that's starting to strike fear into your heart, again, let me, let me reassure you even further. Let me tell you of several polynomial relations that are over, defined over the rationals that you know and love. The first one is that the determinant might be one. That's a polynomial relation in the entries of the matrix uh, with integer coefficients, yeah. right? The second one might be that it preserves a quadratic or a Hermitian form. Okay, so we have to be careful with, with splitting real and imaginary parts in the, in, in the Hermitian case. So it, we might preserve a quadratic form. And the third one is that they might, might lie in a number field. And so they satisfy the minimal polynomial of the number field. Right? And these are all the polynomial relations that I'm going to require. So it's really not that scary after all. Now let GR and GZ be the real and integer points. So that means where the matrix entries are real numbers and where they're integers. Then because the, in, the, so the idea of an arithmetic group is that it's discrete simply because the integers are discrete inside the reals. That's all it is, right? And so, so that means, so G, Z is discrete in the R. And is, and, is, and is, by definition, this is arithmetic. Okay. Well, that's fine. 
but you're telling me you don't care about this, this huge linear algebraic group defined somewhere up in the sky. You're interested in your concrete favorite group, which might be SL2R, SL2C. If you're me, it's SU21. If you're Ursula, it's SLNC, or SLNR, or whatever it was. And some people, it might be the symplectic group, whatever. Okay? Don't worry. So then, you, if you take phi from GR to your favorite group, so G, E, G, S, L, to C, uh, S, U, to 1, etc. This we, we need this to be a continuous subjective homomorphism with compact kernel. Compact kernel is the, the kind of the crucial the crucial deal here. And if gamma sitting inside G is commensurable to, commensurable just means I'm allowed to pass to finite index subgroups and supergroups, and it's the natural invariant when you're talking about arithmetic groups. Because if a finite index subgroup is arithmetic, then the first the original group was arithmetic. It's commensurable to phi of GZ, and gamma is arithmetic. In particular, it's discrete, and by Borel and Harishchandra, it's a lattice. Right? And so, what you what you need to do? So the the so the the arithmeticity test. So this is originally due to Vinberg for Coxeter groups and Mosto. If I have, right, we start out with a number field. A number field K with ring of integers, OK, ring of integers. And what do we want to do? We want to have H is a mission form defined over OK and SU of H to be the associated unitary group. Um, Right, and maybe we can just think of, um, well, I can think of, of it of being a, a three by, maybe for, for the, I can just think of it as three by three complex for the moment, because you can do it in any, any dimension. Okay, and then it will let gamma be, um, be uh, what? S U H intersect S L three of uh, O. K, so they must preserve elements of H, uh, they must preserve the form H, and they must have entries in this ring of integers. Of course, the, the three is just the dimension of the, of the form and the group. All right, and let, let's just assume that we know gamma is discrete. And gamma is arithmetic if H sigma is positive definite or negative definite for every non trivial, so if and only if. This is the important thing. If and only if every non-trivial Galois automorphism sigma. And here, non-trivial means that it should act non-trivially on the adjoint representation of the trace field. Right. So I want it to be non-trivial in the smallest possible way it can possibly be. 
So this is great, because if you actually are given such a group, then you can test arithmeticity really easily, because if it's given to you in terms of a Hermitian form, like it usually is over there, we've got a number field, this is kind of popping out at us, um, we can then test this thing. And so we end up discovering an easy way for tests for non-arithmetic groups. And what I want to do in the last four minutes, and however many, however long it is, that um, since the alarm went, I want to, to, get to show, uh, show you all of the non-arithmetic lattices in SU21. So, because uh, they all arise in this way. All the ones that we know about, that is. Um, hopefully, there's going to be rather a lot more out there that don't arise like this. Um, but nobody knows where they live. So now we're going to think about, or maybe I should have just said why, what's going on here. Right, if this gamma this group is discrete and it's non-arithmetic, well, if I just looked at this whole thing, gamma sorry, subgroup of, that should be a subgroup of, this whole thing of SUH intersect SL3OK, in the non-arithmetic case, that's going to be very non-discrete. And so this gamma has to have infinite index in here. So it has to be very small compared to this group. On the other hand, to be a lattice, it has to be very big because it's actually got to have finite co-volume. And somehow there's a tension between the big and the small, and that's in some way why in higher rank, uh, it's probably not the real reason, but it's my intuitive reason, that in, the, in, in, the, in higher rank, they, those two things, they don't leave any overlap in between. Whereas in rank one, um, at least for SON1 and SUN1, for, at least for small values of N, then we know that there is some space there. So, so non-arithmetic... ...lattices in SU21. These were first discovered by Mosto, um, later some more by Livne, and then Deline and Mosto, and then there was a big, a big hiatus, and then in recent years with Martin de Rowe and Julien Popper, we've found some more. And so I'm going to give them in the form of RSTU as above, and then a list of P. And I can give you some extra information, such as whether they're, they're cofinite or, or non-cofinite. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a list, um, and then we'll stop. So 3, 3, 3, 4, P equals 5, and I'll put a little C for compact, uh, 6, a little N for non-compact. This one is Deline and Mosto. Uh, all the rest in this list are going to be Mosto. 3, 3, 3, 5. P equals 4, compact. 3, 3, 3, 6. P equals 4, compact. Three, 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 seven equals three compact. Three, 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 eight P equals three compact. Three, 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 ten P equals three compact. Uh, so all of these today. Uh, so far, these are due to Mosto in his 1980 paper. Then 3, 3, 3, 2, P equals 9, compact. This is due to Livne in his thesis. All right. Um, And then we get, uh, oh, and I should say, these three are commensurable to um, 3, 3, 3, 3, P equals 7, 8, 10, respectively. And we're going to get 4, 4, 4, 3. 
this is where things get a little more interesting. P is equal to four non-compact five compact, six non-compact, uh, eight compact, 12 compact, uh, four, 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 five, P equals three N, four N, six, 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 four, P equals three N, four N, six N. You see, what I should have done is I prepared a slide and then got the computer to do all of this work for me, but we're nearly there. Three, 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 four, five, They've gone quiet when the AC goes off. The audience has fallen asleep because of all these numbers. And so that these more recent ones, they're, they're, they're um, Martin de Rose, Julien Popper, and myself. Okay, so somehow there's a whole interesting world going on in, in lattices there. And we believe that we found all of the, the, the lattices that can arise in this way. Um, so the two things that could, we could do is we could not have all the generators have the same order. And I've got a student starting to think about that. And uh, the other thing is we can do is go into higher dimensions. And I guess the, the hot news is that um, Martin de Rowe has been analyzing some lattices that exist in three complex dimensions, and he's found a new non-arithmetic lattice there. This is, these are lattices that were constructed by Kuvenberg, Heckman, and Luyenga. So that's a recent preprint that appeared on the archive, I think, about two months ago. Okay, so there's still life, there's still more arithmetic groups. We're really hoping to find infinitely many, but at the moment, this is all that you have. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so yeah, so the, so the Thurston construction is equivalent to, to them being monodromy of certain hypergeometric functions, so certain, certain jet, normal hypergeometric functions in many variables. Um, and I have just, I've been working and I have a preprint almost sorted out that the, the new non-arithmetic lattices, they're all monodromy for higher hypergeometric functions in one variable. So, so there are these notions of, of higher hypergeometric functions um, due to Boykers and Heckman. Um, or, well, they, they, and so that's a, it's a higher order differential equation, but it still just has the three loops around zero, one, and infinity. And, and then they have a nice criterion for when you should be a monodromy group of such a system, and all of these new ones are monodromy groups for, for those systems. But this is still, uh, well, it's still being written up, but it hopefully it's going to be appear um, fairly soon. 